Assalamu alaikum and welcome everyone to this special episode of uh, The Doc Is In. Today we're going to be focusing on the surgical, non-surgical breakthroughs in valvular heart disease procedures and how it reshaped the landscape of cardiac care. We have today joining us to talk about this topic, Dr. Mahmoud Trena. He's the interim chair of the cardiology department and the director of the structural heart disease program. So Dr. Mahmoud, welcome to this episode. Thank you for having me. Inshallah, we're going to be diving in depth about this very transformative breakthrough that has happened in the past few years. I would say it's putting us a little bit away from <laughs> business, but it is the best choice for the patients and we're seeing very good outcomes. So talk to us more about the evolution of this uh, procedure and how it all started. Well, like everything in, like in science and, and in medicine, the less invasive we can get is always the better. And this is what's been always the push. So the kind of the early phases of development, while surgical development started from the 20s and 30s with valve replacements into the 50s and 60s with bypass, uh, uh, putting patients on bypass for valve replacement, we started looking into balloon technologies. As we developed them for the heart arteries, we said we can develop balloon technologies for the valve. valves. And this started in the 80s. And so we started doing a lot of work with valves early on, different valves where we could balloon them open. And we would occasionally get good results on certain groups of patients. But it had a lot of limitations. So when we put a valve, when the valves are very calcified and older, the valve after a while would just come back and be stuck again. True. And so it kind of never really caught traction. Beginning of this century, in the early 2000s, people thought, well, what if we can take the same valve that we put in surgically and we can put it on a catheter, then we can do it all from a catheter base. And that's where kind of this whole approach for catheter-based technologies for valves started. And the very first valve replacement done by a catheter was done in 2002. And it's taken a remarkable journey in the last 20 years. That's exactly what we're going to be diving more into. But let's provide the audience on an overview of the mitra clip and the TAVR. These are the two most common procedures uh, we do here at the hospital. And let's talk uh, more about the mechan uh, technical mechanisms by which the repair and the replacement of the heart valves takes place. Yeah, so, you know, for the TAVR is basically was developed for treatment of a disease called aortic stenosis. Mm. And what that means, all it means is this main valve that's at the top of the heart that pumps blood to the body gets stuck and it's very common just with age. Mm -hmm. So it's usually a disease of older people. And the valve becomes narrower and narrower and the opening becomes less and less until the patients can't breathe and start to collect fluid. So the historical way we replaced this was always we'd go in with surgery, like yourself, goes in, cuts it out and puts in a new valve. Mm -hmm. With the TAVR technology, what we found is that now we can, through a small holes in the groin, we can put a, ca a valve in, load it on either a balloon or load it on a catheter position it inside the old valve and replace it and open it up and functions as a new valve instead. And so it does not need opening of the heart, doesn't need stopping of the heart. The patient's his heart's pumping the whole time while it's being done. And this is as minimally invasive as it gets. Yeah, I mean, the hole is about five millimeters, so mm -hmm. less than a centimeter um, through the leg. The patients, the procedure nowadays under you know proper care, patients are actually mostly awake during it. We give them some local anesthesia, we give them lightly sedated to make them comfortable, but the procedure takes about an hour and then they go home usually the next morning. Sounds too good to be true. Almost is. Let's talk about the clinical trials and the evidence base that's behind that. Yeah. So what do the latest clinical trials and meta-analysis tell us about the safety of the procedure and the longevity of these valves? Because this was the biggest issue at the beginning. Very, very good question. So and. What the, one of the nice things, I think, scientifically, what we really did with the, with the TAVR and that we didn't probably do in many other areas of cardiology was it took a very purposeful way approach in getting it approved. So the first group of patients we ever studied was patients who were not a candidate for surgery. Palliative. So it's just palliative. And we found that patients live longer. Mm -hmm. So that was the first group. Okay, so in patients who can't get surgery, they're going to live longer. Then we took patients that are very high risk for surgery the kind that you don't like to touch, very multiple medical problems, comorbidities, and replace them. And we found in that group of patients, it's better than surgery. Mm -hmm. Then we took it to the next step, which is what we call intermediate risk. Yeah. And so in the intermediate risk group of patients, we found that it's 
equal to surgery, maybe slightly better in certain subgroups. And then finally, the last group of patients was the low risk. So patients, now, when we talk low risk, this is all older people. So we're talking people generally over the 65, but without a lot of medical problems. And we found that the, the results were equal to surgery. And that's where my next question is uh, going to. What does the patient selection for TAVR look like? Because as you said, it's not for everyone. And it's not the number one choice for younger patients. Yeah. So what criteria do you actually go through in choosing these patients for TAVR? The whole decision tree for TAVR and surgery is no longer a monomorphic, this patient's for surgery and this patient's for TAVR. Mm -hmm. This needs a really comprehensive heart team. And this is actually one of the main things that TAVR and these structural valve procedures taught us is that we really need to make each decision for each patient on a team level. And so we look at anatomy a lot. So we get CT scans and look at anatomy of the patient and the feasibility of doing TAVR. Mm -hmm. Some patients for different anatomic reasons are not good candidates for TAVR and we need to do surgery. Some patients have severe coronary disease yeah. that needs to be bypassed. So we'll, do, we'll consider them for, sur for surgery at the same time. And we discuss these cases together. And now no longer are we just talking about simply what's best right now, but we're doing something called lifetime management for these patients. So when we discuss them in our heart team, for example, we're not just talking about which one can we do today or what's the best for the patient today, but assuming these, many of these, especially the younger patients, are going to live 30 and 40 years, mm -hmm. hopefully, we want to plan what are we going to do today and when this valve fails, which it will do in 10 to 15 years, what are we going to do with the next valve? And so we make those decisions as a team, what's best for each individual patient. I can't agree more. It is the heart team. This is the key point, I think, here, is to have a good heart team putting the ego aside because right. that's what was keeping the advancement away at the beginning. I remember when it first started, we were doing like 300, 400 aortic valve cases a year, and now the numbers went down to almost 50 to 100. So you can say almost a quarter of that. But here comes the full purpose of it. It's the, for the best of the patient. Right. We want to serve our patients the best technologies right. and whatever serves them on the long term. Right. And as you said, the valves have evolved. First valves were lasting only two to three years, but now current valves are lasting 10 plus yeah. years. And you know, this, this data, I mean, the whole technology is only 20 years old. True. So we don't, we don't have a lot of long-term data. This, the signals we have so far are the valves, the TAVR valves are lasting about as long as surgical valves. Mm. So it doesn't, we don't have any signal that they're failing earlier or sooner, but you know, data will kind of show us more with time. Okay, so now from a procedural standpoint, what are the critical preoperative and postoperative considerations for patients undergoing TAVR? I always tell my trainees and my fellow doctors, 90% of the work for a TAVR is done before they even come to the lab. Mm -hmm. So um, in our preoperative assessment, when we look at the risk factors and the rest of the clinical story, but most importantly, the CT scan, we foresee almost all the potential challenges and planning that we need to do. So we actually take a lot of time, almost as much time as the procedure itself, in looking at the CAT scan before True. we go into the room and we decide the size of the valve, potential issues with the, with the location, where we're going to position it, what angles, potential issues in delivering the valve, all get addressed way before. So when we go into the room, we have a complete game plan to attack each and every case, and usually we're ready for every challenge that it may, may, may arise. Okay, and now to move from the TAVR to another procedure which has emerged also in the past few years and is gaining a lot of traction, and it's the mitra clip. Yes. So the main difference, again, the TAVR or the transcatheter aortic valve replacement, we implant a valve into the old, old aortic valve, the degenerated one. Now with the mitra clip, it's a totally different technique, it's a totally different heart valve. Yeah, and with, uh, what I, one of the things uh, I, I tell people is, you know, if the aortic valve is uh, algebra, the mitral valve is calculus. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a whole other level of complexity. It's a much more True. complex anatomy. Mm. So the, the, the mitral valve has many more features that make it more challenging to, try, to, to treat with catheters um, in terms of uh, getting product to it or equip, equipment to it, treating it. The pathologies are different and varied. Um, but the mitral clip has a rise out of a clinical need. So what we found over the years is that mitral regurgitation, so we use it to leaking of the mitral valve, 
is a very common problem. Um, and oftentimes it's due to other causes, so not a primary problem in the valve, but due to weakness in the heart muscle. And what studies have shown is that if we leave mitral regurgitation, patients do much worse. Mm -hmm. And if we treat it, it's actually one of the most powerful life-saving therapies we can do. But many of these patients that have this mitral regurgitation are poor candidates for surgery. True. So, you know, I know as a surgeon, if you get a 45-year-old with severe MR and P2 prolapse, you're like, this is the There's perfect no case. discussion. Yeah, no discussion. Beautiful <laughs> case, no problem. You get a fantastic result with a very very low uh, risk to the patient. And long-lasting and Exactly. Yeah. But many of these patients, you know, but that's not always the case, right? True. So you get these mm -hmm. older, more frail, more com comorbid, which have higher risk. And so there's a need for other therapies for these patients. And that's where the mitral clip concept came around. And it comes from actually an old surgical technique. Alfieri. Exactly. So yeah. one of the original techniques for difficult to challenge repairs is something called the Alfieri stitch, mm -hmm. where, they, where, where the, Dr. Alfieri developed a stitch where you put the two leaflets together, the anterior and the posterior, and you suture them together, bring it in kind of to a little figure mm -hmm. of eight, and that fixes a lot of the leak. And it's pretty good. Not as good as most repairs, but a pretty good therapy. It serves the purpose, as you said, in these very sick patients. Otherwise, they don't have any surgical uh, consider, or they're not considered for surgery too high risk. So we could say that this is more for like a last, uh, like a final option yeah. for those patients. And it's a repair and it's not a replacement. Right. Do you see a replacement coming? Yes. So there's been a lot of development. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, when I give talks on this, I usually have uh, w one nice slide where I put every single product that's in development. Uh -huh. And there's about 50 different 50, companies, five zero. Five zero companies developing this mm -hmm. because there's a lot of interest in this field. From repair technologies, all kinds of types, to re valve replacements. There's mm -hmm. probably around 10 or 11 valve replacements that are being actively developed. Three or four of them are commercially being developed at the time. So there's a lot of interest in technology in this. Um, I, think, I think just like we do in surgery, in order to pre treat this valve, again, because it's more of an algebra, uh, more of a calculus mm, than a algebra. basic algebra, mm. you kind of have to have multiple tools. Mm. So in some cases, this Alfieri stitch or the clip type treatment is going to work great, and it works great in many patients. Mm -hmm. But many patients their leaflets are too far and or they're calcified or there's other issues they're not a candidate for this and i think having a replacement valve that we can put in percutaneously is is a great option there's only one valve that's currently being uh, that's currently fda approved and mm -hmm. it's available um, and we've started in the early stages of getting that valve but i think over the next probably two to three years, at least two or three others are going to hit the market and we're going to see a lot more development in the valve replacement. Hopefully. Around. But if, we, if you can tell the audience, what makes it so challenging? We've been, we've been doing the TAVR for like 15 years now. The mitral valve, not yet. What makes it more challenging than the aortic so valve? It's a great question because mitral valve is usually almost all one problem. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, it's usually a circular valve. Mm -hmm. It's usually stuck and has a lot of calcium, so I put a valve in, and we open a valve, and it stays in place. That's it. The mitral valve actually is not a circle. It's more of a wavy annulus, yeah. so it goes in waves. So putting something in there becomes more less stable. It's not as calcified, so anchoring a valve and putting a valve in becomes more challenging. The pathology, the leaflet, it has six parts, as you know, so you have three on the anterior side and three on the posterior mm -hmm. side, and you can have problems at different points. So they, so, and then sometimes the ring is very dilated, sometimes the leaflet is down, sometimes the leaflet is up, sometimes the saddle is different shape. So finding a geometric solution is a problem. On top of that, there's no direct way to the valve. So the aortic valve, we come in from the leg, and the first thing we hit when we hit the heart is the aortic valve. Aortic valve. But the mitral valve is either beyond that, mm -hmm. so you gotta go through one valve, or you got to come from the other side, go from the right side of the heart, cross over to the left and put something which carries its own challenges. Risk. Or what's being done now, no. the only valve that's approved mm -hmm. is by a direct surgical puncture, but there still a, needs a small incision. A very small incision, yeah, which is still very acceptable compared to the big surgery, which is the exactly. open heart surgery. And I'm sure the imaging and diagnostics has helped, the evolution of these techniques have helped a lot uh, in planning these surgeries and actually even intra-procedural. 
tremendous. Uh -huh. These procedures could not be done with the, with the, without the ex rapid expansion and improvement in imaging technologies. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in training 20 years ago, we barely could see there's leaking of the mitral valve or there's not. Listen. Now we have with the CTs and then on the transesophageal echoes with the 3D echocardiograms or ultrasounds, mm -hmm. we can get pinpoint analysis of the exact problem and where it is which is necessary during the procedures. During the TAVR, like we talked about, the CT scan is absolutely essential with detailed measurements. With the uh, mitral clip procedure, we need to have pinpoint imaging mm -hmm. live during the heart because we're doing these and clipping on a beating heart. And cross over. And so, something. exactly, and crossing mm -hmm. over from the right side to the left side and putting it in a perfect position mm -hmm. where right where the leak is takes very detailed analysis on imaging. And without the rapid advancements we've had in those fields, mm -hmm. really all the, many of the patients that we treat now couldn't have been treated 10, 15 years ago. Let's talk about our results here at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Let's, let's compare our results. We've been doing this now for a few years, compared to the literature and to big centers. Yeah. Where do we stand? Well, luckily we've had a very good uh, experience with our, especially with our TAVR uh, patient population. So we've been doing it now close to, we, you know, really ramped up with time, but about close to seven years. And uh, mm -hmm. we're all closing in on 500 cases. You know, as, as you know, yes, and we've been going up about 40 to 50% volume sure. every year. So sure. it's really, the program has been uh, building rapidly. And I think uh, kind of be, being one of the biggest programs in the region. One of the things we were really centered on is that our partner institution is Cleveland Clinic uh, mm -hmm. main campus in, in Ohio. And we've really tried to take the, the excellent outcomes and the techniques that are applied there and bring them to our patients here in Abu Dhabi. And that's where the multidisciplinary team approach key, comes. Key, key, because we have, a t t we have an amazing team. You know, you know, as you know from the surgical side is a key partner in our TAVR program mm -hmm. and you and the other surgeons are often with us, always with us in the cases, and we plan together, and we plan for any high-risk issues. Like I said, planning is the key. Is the key. So when we have issues with peripheral or access, or we're worried about the size of the arteries, we get our vascular colleagues involved. When we need to, we can approach from the legs, we often approach from the neck, and we have excellent vascular surgeons that help us with it. So getting everyone on board, we have a fantastic cardiac anesthesia team that really helps us in the proper monitoring. Having things in a regimented, organized manner allows us to do that, and then we do them regularly. We do them on one set day. We do TAVRs all day, three to four every Tuesday. True. We call it TAVR Tuesdays here. Yeah. And it's just a set routine that everyone follows allows us to have great outcomes. That's great. I think uh, with that, we can conclude our session for today. It's clear that the uh, technologies like MitraClip and the TAVR represent the incremental improvements in cardiac care and it has proven itself over the years. This is the, the key point, as an excellent alternative for open heart surgery. And this is what most of the patients are pushing for. And the more knowledge, the more education we can provide for those patients and the doctors that send the patients to us is gonna be a key factor in uh, providing the best care and the best health for those patients that we're gonna be taking care of it. Um, and it challenges us to, to be constantly learning about new techniques and be on top of the things. Embrace the new technologies, be on top of it. And as Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, we should be able to represent and provide these modern technology, cutting ed edge technologies to those patients as the best place to get care for our patients and our loved ones. Thank you so much, Dr. Trena, for this. Thank you. Uh, this was very eye-opening. And I hope our audience uh, will follow that and know exactly what we've been talking about and spreading the word. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching us. Thanks, Dr. Mahmoud, again. Thank you for having me. It was great.